Welcome everyone to the 2024 PI Conference and our 2.30 session, the Serenity Within Stress Management for PI. We'll get started in just a moment. My name is Julie Magnuson and I'm the Research Project Manager at the Immune Deficiency Foundation and I will be your moderator for this presentation. This session is 45 minutes in length and we will be sticking to that time frame. If time permits, we'll be happy to answer a handful of questions after the presentation. Please also note that the information presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. And here at IDF, we offer a wide array of educational presentations, including presentations developed by healthcare and management professionals invited to serve as presenters. The views and opinions expressed by guest speakers do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of IDF. But without further ado, I am proud to introduce our presenter, Jody Topp. Jody Topp is a psychotherapist with a private practice in New York. She has more than 27 years of direct care experience with children, adolescents, and adults. She practices individual, couples, family, and group therapy. Her specialty area is chronic illness and rare diseases. Jody is also an expert lecturer published writer, and active mental health contributor for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Jody also leads the monthly Immune Deficiency Foundation's Get Connected Caregivers and Spouses slash Partner Support Groups. Jody is also a patient living with PI. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Jody. Thank you, Shirley. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Come on in. Can everyone hear me? Great. So those who are hanging in the back of the door, I'm going to have you guys come to the front, kind of move on in, and then we'll shut the door behind so we can get started here today. Um, first and foremost, it is fabulous to see everybody here in person today. I am thrilled to be here with all of you, and this has made my day because it's been about five years since we've all been able to be together for a national conference. So I will start off, before I put my professional hat on and I get all serious, uh, to remind all of you that I'm a patient. And I live this too. I've got my nasal rinses. I have all my drugs that I'm thinking about today. I was hoping that I wasn't going to sleep in too late and uh, forget some things due to brain fog today. So please remember, as I'm giving all of this mental health information here today and a lot of professional information, that I get it. I live this too. I have my ups and downs, and I ride the roller coaster, and I'm here with you. So with that being said, we're going to get into the professional mental health stuff here today. One of the things that I think is most important to remember about managing your mental health with PI is that this is hard. This is not an easy disease. Nobody signed up and said, hey, I want to have a rare blood disease, <laughs> not be able to fight off infections. This is. This is a hard disease to have, and it's also rare. And that creates another set of complications. But it doesn't always have to be hard. And so the point of managing our medical care is to make sure our physical care is better. And the purpose of managing our mental health care is to make sure that our social, emotional, and recreational world is better. So with that being said, I'm going to talk about my presentation today. It's called Serenity Within, Stress Management for PI. So what we're going to do today is learn to identify stressors and coping strategies which are unique to PI and our experience. PI is rare. It's different than having a well-known disease. And because of that, we need a targeted approach for not only our physical health care, but for our mental health care as well. So riding the roller coaster. Who's ever described living with PI as living with a roller coaster? Raise your hand. Yeah. It's unpredictable. We never know what's going to happen. And there's a constant up and down of flares. And the flares can be really hard to manage because sometimes we know when they're coming and sometimes we don't. And that sort of ride and that sort of uncertainty, consistently being uncertain, can be really challenging. So we're going to talk about recognizing and managing stress and trauma responses, how to manage your nervous system when your body is on alert, coping with loneliness, managing relationships and caregiving relationships, developing coping strategies and resilience, mental health resources, and then I've included some of my references here for you all today. 
So PI triggers and stressors. So as I get into my presentation today, I want to define what stress actually is. Stress is a response to normal, everyday things that sometimes bother us. Every human being experiences stress. It's a part of life. It's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just dealing with difficult things that come our way. And we learn how to handle them. And one of the things that we want to learn how to do is not to get upset that there's stressors, but learn how to handle it better. Because having stressors is a part of life. So for our particular stressors, we have medical crises, changes in healthcare or medical instability, isolation, both physical and emotional. The last four years have been really tough in our community with COVID-19. It was not easy before uh, the pandemic and it's been really hard in particular with our community. And I know many of you um, in this room and who are not here today because it wasn't safe for them to be here today and they couldn't travel have dealt with loneliness. And I know that that's been really hard. So we also have to deal with shifts in our medical care team, shame or misunderstanding from medical professionals. I'm sure every single one of us in this room has had that on our way to diagnosis. Grief or loss for relationships, identity, educational and work purposes. A lack of understanding about rare disease. I think this is a huge part of the PI experience, trying to explain to other people what your rare illness looks like for people who don't understand can be really hard. And sometimes people say the wrong things because they just don't get it. Managing the emotional regulation of your loved one. We also have to deal, we have in addition to dealing with our own emotional response, we also have to deal with the emotional responses of the people around us, how they respond when we get sick or when we get upset, and how they handle it. Clinical mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and trauma-related disorders. Uh, many people, regardless of having PI or not, face mental health conditions, but we have a large proportion of our population will face clinical mental health conditions. In fact, there's been many studies about this. Um, in 2017, I had the opportunity to work uh, along with the Immune Deficiency Foundation and the Mood Disorder Clinic at Harvard on a protocol for mindfulness meditation because of the research that we found that we have higher rates of anxiety and depression than the rest of the population. Financial stressors and burdens, this is not a cheap illness, and medical gaslighting. I'm sure there are people in this room who faced members of the medical community who didn't understand, didn't listen, or denied that you had something going on. All right, so we're gonna get into some uh, trauma and neurobiology, and this is brain science, so please bear with me if you don't grab all of this today. This is just meant to be an overview to learn a little bit about how trauma affects us individually. I also want to say before I start my conversation about trauma, because it seems to be a very hot topic in mental health these days, and sometimes trauma is really being defined as trauma, and sometimes people overgeneralize trauma as a stress response. But what trauma is, is the overwhelming feeling which impacts the nervous system's capacity to cope when, a, when presented with a stressor. Dan Siegel is one of the top trauma researchers, and that is his definition of what trauma is. If the stressor becomes familiar, it allows us to stay balanced and integrated. So for example, how many of you, when you started either you know, your immunoglobulin, sub-Q, IV treatment, thought, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? And now, <laughs> and you may still be there if you're new to the game, but now, you don't think about it. It's no big deal. It's not, you know, you attach the same emotional attachment to brushing your teeth as you do to getting, you know, your IVAG. It's something that's a part of your world. And so our goal is to learn how to cope with things. So when something initially was a stressor, it no longer becomes a stressor or the stressor that presents itself, we recover more quickly. An unbalanced nervous system blocks our capacity for flexible, adaptive, and stable functioning. We want to balance our ner nervous system so that when difficult things happen, we can handle it. 
The purpose of therapy and coping strategies for trauma is to create, a, to create more integration in the brain, which allows for increased flexible thinking and a better capacity to make decisions, think clearly, and increase calm. So the purpose of using mental health strategies, coping strategies, and therapy is to help us so that we, when faced with the stressor, can deal with it in an easier way. So, and our overall goal from a deeper level is to change our cognition, our beliefs, to regulate our emotions and decrease the physiological response of stress. Okay, so this is Crash Course in Nervous System First Aid. Um, of recent, I'm sure some of you have heard of the fight or flight response. There are more trauma responses that in the last five to 10 years we're now using in the mental health space, but I'm just gonna point out the four main ones, which are fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. Flight is the feeling that you need to flee, that sort of cortisol response where you feel, okay, I need to do something about this. Flight, I gotta get out of here. Freeze is you become withdrawn. You're just so overwhelmed that you shut down. And fawn is a trauma response that's usually in context of a chronic circumstance, situation, or relationship. And fawn is to appease. So when you are set by a particular stressor, you want to make it better. That's your role. So the different types of trauma responses aren't all bad responses. And often we think of, you know, oh, wow, if our nervous system is being set off, well, wait, this isn't good. But that's actually not true. We need the fight, flight, or trauma responses because you might be in a situation that there's a crisis and you need to do something about it. And it alerts your body to know when to do something. And I will get into that a little bit more specifically for our community when we talk about medical trauma. So there are different parts of our nervous system. We've got the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that creates calm, it relaxes us. We've got the autonomic nervous system, which is controlling for involuntary action. And we've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight. That's the nervous system that kicks in when, oh my gosh, I gotta do something. And the vagus nerve I showed, and that's the longest nerve of our autonomic nervous system, which regulates the nervous system. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about complex medical trauma, and it goes into the fight or flight of what I was just talking about. What we really want to learn is how to access our nervous system in a positive way. So for example, if we shut off our fight or flight and we have a medical emergency and something happens and we just don't respond to it, that's not adaptive, right? So we still want to have a response when something's wrong because it tells us to notify our doctor. It tells us to go to the emergency room. It tells us, hey, something's wrong and I need to do something about this. So that's adaptive. We want to be able to continue to do that. So that's not a bad thing. What we want to do is figure out how to turn that off so that the fight or flight doesn't happen every time you get IVIG, right? Because the first, first couple times, you might feel the fight or flight with it, and you're curious, how is this going to work? What am I going to do when I'm doing my sub-Q? But if you have to do this for the rest of your life, we don't want you to have a fight or flight response every time you do it. So medical, complex medical trauma. There's a difference between an acute medical trauma and a complex. So acute, I'm sure everyone in this room has an acute medical trauma. It's, you know, you've had an emergency, you, you know, you've gone to the hospital, you had an asthma flare, you broke your leg, something happened in a very specific way. It happened, the medical event is over, there's a cure, and we're good to go and we move on. Complex medical trauma is in the context of a chronic illness. So as lovely as we all would like this to be, there isn't a cure for our disease quite yet. And so we have to live with it. And because of that, and because of living with primary immunodeficiency disease, we're going to have ongoing medical conditions, medical problems, medical flares. And sometimes those flares can cause us to feel upset. Sometimes they can cause us to bring back a trauma. If any of us had a really serious or life-threatening medical trauma, if you have that experience again, it can be really frightening. So different types of complex medical trauma are witnessing a loved one suffering due to life-threatening illness and experience with medical trauma is traumatic. 
people around us are also affected um, by the healthcare conditions we've experienced. Medical trauma is different than other forms of complex trauma because it's chronic and the stressor comes from within. I'm gonna say this again. Medical trauma is different from other forms of complex trauma because it is chronic and the stressor comes from within. In all other traumas, the trauma is placed upon us by something else. It could be a car accident, a relationship, a global pandemic, any of these sorts of different types of you know, personal, interpersonal, existential life trauma. But our trauma is coming from our bodies. And that makes it a lot different because it's not going away and it's part of who we are. Medical trauma can be useful because it sends the alert to our body that something's wrong. And I just talked about this. It sets off the fight or flight response, which can lead to increased mental health symptoms. And we want to utilize our nervous system to be resourceful, but not overwhelmed. Caregivers can also experience complex trauma from parenting a child or also living with a spouse who has a chronic health care condition. And I add that to anybody loving any of this. Okay, brain health. Strategies to enhance the parasympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic that is, and improve integration. So there are lots of things that we can do to lower our stress levels, to lower our cortisol. And these are just a few of these. So, um, and thinking about the activities that I just listed, they also enhance dopamine and endorphins. So exercise and physical movement. And that includes any of you who have hypermobility issues or mobility issues in general, might just be moving whatever body part is around, but just getting some sort of movement um, gets our brain thinking in a different direction. Creative expression, doing something that's different, that makes you think about something else, that's a part of an expression of all of us. Learning a new hobby, physical touch, and in a safe way. So that doesn't mean that, you know, if you're about to go hug a stranger and worried about if they have the coronavirus. Not telling you to do that, but to find a way and a safe way to be able to have some physical touch. Joyful distractions. Do the things that you love to do. Managing your medical health care, going to doctor's appointments, paying your bills, dealing with insurance is not fun. We need to balance this by giving meaning to our life and continue to prioritize doing things that we love. Other examples are listening to music, community support, connecting with friends, family, and loved ones, and your community here. And this is amazing that everybody's in this room. I want every single person who walks out of this room today to introduce yourself, yourself to someone that you have not met or you don't know. The value of meeting someone else who has PI and saying hello, just that alone can make you feel less lonely and somebody else. Psychotherapy. I highly recommend uh, mental health services and seeking therapy, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Group therapy. So there's professionally led support groups and peer led support groups, and the IDF has done an incredible job with their Get Connected programming. And if you haven't signed up for that, I'll talk about that a little bit today. I encourage that. And I also lead our two caregivers groups. We have one for um, spouses, and we have one for either parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles who take care of someone. Mindfulness and meditation resources, maintain daily routines, and getting into nature. Resilience. I don't think we talk about how resilient all of us are and also the good thing that comes from dealing with trauma. So if we're gonna be exposed to trauma, there are some good things that come from this. And not all trauma leads to despair. Navigating PI can lead to feelings of competency and strength. Resilience is a positive response to coping with the stressor of chronic illness that leads to adaptability. Here are a couple ways that we can foster resilience in chronic illness. Remember your abilities and remind others. There's so many things that we have to do that we can't do, that we have to make modifications for, and sometimes we forget all the things that we can do. And sometimes we need to hear this from other people. And we need to let other people know how hard we work to be where we are and of our capabilities so that they can support us too. Develop self-care and medical competency. 
It takes a level of organization and sophistication to navigate our complicated medical system with a rare disease. Learn how to adapt to change. Well, everybody sitting in this room has because you got yourself here today. And some of it is not by choice. But part of living with PI is adapting to change. Things are going to change over time. Our healthcare status is going to change over time. It's not linear. And so we have to learn to deal with the roller coaster and know that there's gonna be times where our healthcare dips, there's gonna be times when our mental healthcare dips, but we also have to remember that we will get back to a place of stability again. Utilize mental health resources, and I'll talk a bit about this, and peer and community support. Relationship management. Social connections are key. Studies have shown that the greatest indicator of improved social and physical health are social connections and that the absence of this can worsen mental health. There's not a person in the world who didn't experience this during the COVID-19 pandemic. So many people were separated from people they loved, from things that they loved, and there were, you know, even prior to the pandemic, we've had studies about this, but isolation is one of the worst factors that can lead to depression and anxiety, and you have to make it a priority to try to connect with other people, and all of you are doing that here today because you showed up or you're showing up online here today. It's important that we continue to foster those relationships. Isolation and time spent on medical care can challenge relationships. Identify changes when you can no longer work and participate in former recreational activities that can lead to lost friendships and, con and connections. Many of us have lost friendships over the years. When people stop showing up, they get tired of us complaining that we're not feeling well or we can't go somewhere. But remember that there are people who do support us and we have to continue to foster those relationships with people that we do. Social engagement improves brain integration and can heal stress and trauma. You are not alone. Relationship management, it takes a village. This is not a one person disease. <laughs> There's nobody in this room who can do all of this alone. And your team isn't just whether you have a spouse or a, or a child or a parent. It's the friendships that you have. It's your medical care team. There's a lot of people who help us to stand where we are. Foster our relationships with our family, loved ones, and peers. Acknowledge that family, friends, and loved ones may not understand how you need support. This is going to be an ongoing conversation. I got diagnosed 17 years ago, and I speak about mental health, and I provide mental health resources, and I still have to remind my community members what I need. It's going to be an ongoing conversation, and sometimes I think what happens is we have one conversation with someone and says, hey, I'd really like you to do X, Y, and Z, and then the person doesn't do it. So then we give up and say, oh, they're not gonna help out. We have to remind people from time to time, even though it might be top of mind for us, it may not be for someone else. Pick up a, pick up a hobby um, or interest to meet new people. Oh, I skipped a couple. Make community care a priority. Maintain a supportive community. Foster old and new bonds. Grieve friendships when they're no longer supportive. The truth is there's gonna be people in our lives that just can't handle this. And that's the truth. And we have to accept that. But we also have to remember that there are people who are. And there will be a process of grieving some of those people who no longer can be the friends that we need them to be. Lean into the support of and available friendships. Join peer-led and patient support groups. Engage in the Immune Deficiency Foundation programming to develop peer bonds. The Immune Deficiency Foundation has wonderful programming and their IDF Get Connected groups. If someone has, if you haven't signed up, I encourage you to sign up today. It gives you the opportunity to be able to meet people all across the United States and around the world to just check in, form some friendships with other people who just get it. Okay, this is a shout out to my caregivers in the room. Put on your oxygen mask first. Caregiver burnout is real and caregiver burnout is a stress response as a result of being overwhelmed by the responsibility of managing a loved one's physical and emotional needs. Most of us didn't know that we were gonna be caregivers. We didn't know our child was gonna be sick. We may not have known that our spouse was going to have a primary immunodeficiency and you, you know, wind up, all of a sudden, you wind up in this role that you hadn't anticipated. And a lot of us didn't know how to, 
how to navigate that. Caregiver stressors can be financial burdens, major life changes, changes in support system, decreased time for daily obligations and self-care, the burden of infection control. This is another big one in our community that's different than other chronic health care conditions is that our caregivers have to keep us safe too. So that creates a level of anxiety for them that they feel, oh my gosh, what if I go out and I get the flu or I catch something or I catch COVID and I'm responsible for you. So that can add a, a layer of stress that's a little bit different for our community. Okay, where was I? Do, do, do. Oh, compassion fatigue. So it's not uncommon, you know, many of us feed on our caregivers as our support systems. You know, I know I do that with mine and be like, this happened today and let me tell you about all the things in my medical care that went wrong. Um, but sometimes caregivers need a break too. So signs and symptoms of caregiver burnout are increased fatigue, withdrawal from relationships and personal commitments, decreased feelings of joy and fulfillment. Common caregiver feelings can be shame, guilt, anger, isolation, resentment, and feeling overwhelmed. Caregiver burnout can lead to clinical mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, fear of losing a loved one or experiencing a loved one's medical trauma, isolation, and loneliness. So what can we do? Caregiver first aid. Communicate your needs and establish boundaries. It's important that you remember that you're still in a relationship and you, your loved one is still a capable person. You've got to be able to tell them when something's wrong. When you don't, you end up building resentment, there ends up being a break, and your loved one feels like you don't feel they can handle things and it makes them feel like you don't find them capable. And it's important to remember that they're human too. Maintain other aspects of your relationship outside of caregiving. Remember that you're a mom, a partner, and a significant other. And find ways for mutual, mutuality in your relationship. Part, partnership is not a one-way street. This will make your loved one feel capable. And get peer support, again. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about it over and over again, and you're here. Reassess roles and responsibilities when you feel overwhelmed, and seek professional mental health support. I also recommend our free monthly caregiver-led support groups led by myself. They are free to parents, loved ones, spouses. They're once a month on Wednesdays and Thursdays and free of charge, so I highly recommend that you guys show up. Loneliness. Research has shown that living with a chronic illness, especially rare disease, is one of the greatest factors contributing to loneliness. PI can feel very lonely for several reasons. Increased isolation, not just because we isolate ourselves, but we actually have to physically isolate sometimes. The last four years has been really hard with COVID. Um, but there are times where, depending on our medical care and what's going on, we have to isolate. Time spent managing medical care and feeling sick, immunocompromised precautions, limited val validation and understanding of rare disease and how it's treated. This can make us feel lonely too. How many times have you tried to explain to certain people and they still just don't get it? Lack of purpose and meaning can also make us feel lonely. So how do we decrease this? Find ways to connect to other people and continue to make it a priority and use virtual options when you can't see people in person. Explain to other people how you can see them in a safe, supported way and find ways to do this. Increase your understanding of PI. Rare disease can be hard to understand, and especially depending on where you are in your journey. And loved ones can mistake, this is what I call, inconsistent capabilities for a lack of validation for your experience. So someone will think, oh wait, you did X, Y, and Z this one time. I thought you were able to like go out to dinner, but wait, I didn't understand that now you can't go out to dinner because it's winter or there's more COVID going on. There's going to be, or you have a health flare where you're really having a hard time and you're experiencing too much chronic fatigue and you can't show up. I think people have a really hard time understanding that sometimes we can do things and sometimes we can't. And it feels like we have to re-explain it and we're going to have to re-explain it. But that validation can decrease resentment and it increases connection. Find new purpose and meaning outside of managing your health. This, 
Dizzy is a full-time job, so I get it. <laughs> it's not easy, and there's not a lot of free time, and there's a lot that people have had to give up. But it's really important, you know, some people can't work, some people can no longer do former recreational activities, but find something that you can do. This will allow you to feel grounded and could also lead to new friendships. Oh, great, I'm getting the time signal. <laughs> All right, the importance of mental health support. When we're better able to manage our mental health support, it makes it easier to manage the roller coaster of PI. Many caregivers and patients will experience medical trauma, burnout, grief, and loss, which can lead to me clinical mental, mental health conditions, such as anxiety, depression, and trauma-related diagnoses. So I'm going to say this very, very clearly to everybody in this room. There's nothing wrong with experiencing clinical mental health conditions because of this disease. I, if any of you don't, I would be surprised. There are a lot of reasons for this. So please try not to shame yourself if you experience any of these symptoms because it's hard. It, this is not easy and there's a variety of reasons for this. But it's important to recognize, it's important to manage. So the benefits of improved mental health are problem solving capabilities, which make us better able to tackle our physical health demands. We are better able to maintain close relationships and support, which decreases isolation, loneliness, and improves healthcare outcomes. If you're not feeling resentful, upset, not heard by the people in your life, it's easier for you to engage and want to spend time with them. And it's easier to manage transitions with flexibility and the roller coaster of living with PI. Okay, so I've listed some professional mental health resources and these resources are also available on the IDF mental health page, and what's very convenient about it is I help create that page. So I'm gonna to go to that link in a second. Um, I'll show you guys the link in a second, and that way it makes it so much easier, and I don't have to do a million slides about this every time I talk. Mm -hmm. So I highly encourage you to seek mental health therapy just in the same way you guys have an immunologist or a primary care. This is a hard disease, and it's difficult to do all of this on your own, and it's a good place to be able to go and process and talk about how to manage this. There's different types of talk therapy, and there's different types of modalities. I've listed all of them, but they're also on our resource page as well. People often ask how to find a therapist, because this can be really hard, um, and not everybody can connect with a chronic illness therapist. You might not have someone in your state. Connect with somebody that you feel comfortable with. All therapists know how to treat mental health, and that's really important. There's also genetic testing now for psychotropic medication. For those of you who may need psychotropic medication, there are psychiatric practitioners who use Genocyte and Genomind. Because of our complicated medical health system, our um, symptoms, it's also, it may be important to make sure that you get on the right meds. And we've got support groups. So here is the Immune Deficiency Foundation mental health page, and all of the things that I just listed are on this page. And I'm just gonna quickly click on it. Yay, we have internet access. Um, so we've got addressing mental health, and we talk a little bit about how it affects us. Um, I also have listed on here our, um, the SEEK support, so the support groups are on here. There are several different presentations that um, have been done for the IDF. I have done some of them. And then there's also some organizations on here. Okay. So in conclusion, managing mental health is a key component to supporting patients, families, and loved ones living with primary immunodeficiency disease. You can improve your mental health outcomes through utilizing supportive service, services, and you are not alone. You have the Immune Deficiency Foundation and the greater PI community. We have your back. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, um, here is my contact information. I on my um, at my on my website. I have, and in, my, in the media, and for those of you who use Facebook and Instagram, I do a monthly article. I write a monthly article about coping cr with chronic illness and rare disease, and my presentations for the IDF over the last, what, five or six years that they've been putting everything online are also on there as well. So you can 
find out a little bit more about managing chronic illness, PI, and mental health. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim, so sure. much. All right, everyone. Um, so, I think we're actually going to have a little bit of time for just a very brief Q&A, but before we get to that, I do just want to share a few IDF resources. So if you leave today with a lingering or unanswered question, please submit it to our Ask IDF platform and someone will reach out to you directly or connect you to the appropriate resources. We can also help you get connected with others in the PI community through our virtual Get Connected groups. Um, you know, IDF Get Connected groups, they offer individuals diagnosed with PI and their family members the opportunity to connect, share experiences, and receive support in their local communities. And finally, please remember to complete your session survey through the conference app. But again, we do have some time for Q&A. Please raise your hand and I will bring, um, I'll come around with the mic. So, oh, okay, well, we're gonna, I can't wait, Josh, limited time, but. Let's do Josh. <laughs> Yep, that works. Well, things are being recorded, so <laughs> bear with me, everyone. Hi, Jody. Um, Hi. I'm going to get by the microphone, so I'm not yelling back. Yeah, there you go. Um, do you have any recommendations for natural ways to reduce blood pressure, like some sort of diet or things that aren't like medicine or taking more pills? So. That is a little bit out of my expertise in terms of like lowering blood pressure. However, if you're talking about not from like a PI standpoint, but from the things that I was talking about today, yes, all the resources I was listening, I was listing because cortisol is the fight or flight response that increases blood pressure. So that whole little set of things today, all the activities that I listed, like joyful distractions and nature and all of those things can decrease blood pressure in the moment. Thank yes. you. All right, who else has a question? Okay, just one real quick, I saw your hand pop up. Okay. Hi, Jody. thanks for being here. My name's Regina and I have CVID. Um, just because we have you an expert in the room, I, will, and I know that therapy techniques are not one size fits all, but do you have a quick tip or like a technique that generally works well, like whether it's mindfulness or CBT trick for people with chronic illness that you can share? I, I think, so in terms of modalities, is that what you're talking about there? Well, I think for the things that I was talking about today, it's learning how to identify what your stressors are and then choosing the coping strategies that work for you. So of all the, the list of the coping strategies that I listed, try different things. So if you're feeling a fight or flight sort of feeling, it's better, you know, if you can and you have access, it's good to do something physical to calm that down. So maybe you go for a walk, maybe you start doing a, um, you know, doing chores. So you're doing something that decreases that energy. If you're feeling sad and lonely, you might need to reach out to a friend. So I think you match your coping strategy based upon what you're experiencing at the time. Yeah, I saw your hand up too, so I'm making my way around. Hi, Jody. Thank you so much for um, taking the opportunity to talk to us about this. Um, I, my name is Julie. I have CVID. I have two children, 15 or 16 and 23 with CVID. I also have borderline personality disorder and complex regional pain syndrome. So I'm really magical. But um, DBT therapy, I didn't see that listed, but that's something that my psychiatrist mm -hmm. has suggested. Um, but I've had a really hard time finding therapists for myself and for my family because they all say, you're outside of our scope. So what do you do when everybody's like, wow, you're a whole lot and I don't know how to deal with you? So yes, there's lots of different modalities that um, can be used. DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy, and a lot of the programs now use it. It's a psychoeducational, so it's a psyche educational format to help with um, emotional regulation. So that's a different type of modality, certainly that people can utilize. But I think that the bigger thing is to look for um, look for people in your state who can treat complex medical health care conditions. And more and more people are in, you know, are in this space. 
So, and there are going to be therapists, you know, what has sort of happened over the last 10, 15 years is people have, in, in mental health, it's really become a little bit more narrowed. Um, I also recommend seeing somebody who's seasoned, seeing somebody who's been around, who has been practicing for a long time, they've had experience with a lot of different types of um, mental health issues and will feel a little bit more capable than someone who's just starting out. I want to take another one over here, and then I will move over. I haven't forgotten you all on that side. Hi, Jody. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I had a question. Um, as a patient of color, uh, whether the IDF is interested in investing in more intersectional peer support groups or even um, listing some additional resources for patients of color, it can be a little challenging um, to go. I've been in a lot of different support groups and sometimes I'm, you know, the token brown person and uh, when you experience racism in healthcare or microaggressions, macroaggressions, um, it's really hard to talk about that um, on top of that uh, when you're joining these groups where it's not necessarily diverse and I think that's very true for caregivers of color too. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, certainly that is you know, and I'm sorry that you've had that experience on top of all of the other discriminatory <laughs> experiences coming with living with PI. Um, that's something I can't answer in terms of um, the IDF, maybe, Julie, I don't know if you can answer that in terms of programming, but um, I'm not sure what else they're offering, but I certainly suggest that you make that, a, you know, a suggestion and reach out to Alyssa Creamer and Jenna who run the IDF support groups and um, put that, you know, at the end of, each of these sessions, I know that there's a survey and a questionnaire, and so maybe you could add that to that as a issue. That's exactly what I want to say, too. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, coming over to this side. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Hello, hi, Jody. Hi. I was just wondering, you we saw the uh, slide that had all the resources for finding um, therapists. Is any one of them um, a place where we can find one um, for chronic illnesses? Yeah. So one of the, I always recommend this in my lecture series because it is hard to find um, therapists and it's hard to find chronic illness therapists. Psychology Today, the therapist directory, and that's in the link that's on the mental health page for IDF, I have that included. You can actually put in your state, your zip code, you can put in chronic illness as um, a specialty area and find out who's in your area as well. You can put in insurance, there's lots of different issues, but it is the largest um, listserv of um, mental health providers in the United States. Okay, I think we might have time for one more. All right, I got here. I was looking at the Connect Get Connected groups and um, it's just my husband and I in our family and I didn't see one that you could have like both the caregiver and the and the zebra together. I didn't see it. Because we're not doing that. We're it's separate. So um, the purpose of why we did well, first off, we don't. Ha um, the purpose of why we were doing that is so that there was a separate space for caregivers um, to talk outside of that. But they don't offer something like that at this time. that so um, I'm a get connected leader and a lot of significant others or spouses come to my meeting I do Ohio but if you look at the certain states wherever you are I'm sure mr. can come come along yeah we don't we don't stay thank you Carol for explaining that yes and also Carol what state are you in that you leave Ohio. <laughs> that's my home state so I do know that even though, the, and tell me if I'm right, the IDF Get Connected groups are state specific, a lot of people go to a lot of the different states. You don't have to be from a particular state. So people will pop in and try different IDF Get Connected groups. So, and some people participate more than once. So it's just a fit. So yeah, thank you, Carol. In case anyone didn't hear that, calendar is on the website. Yes. And it's also on yes. the mental health page where it says get support. You click on that link and it's on there as well. All right. 
think we're out of time, though, for today. Thank you so much, Jody.